please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. It's a strong close to the trading week on the Lal Street. The Nifty nears the 10,000 mark and the Sensex gains 160 points. For the week, the market gains in four out of five sessions as mid-caps outperform. And the auto sector shrugs off the GST slowdown as August sales hit top gear. Maruti beats expectations along with Aisha Motors and Ashok Leyland. M&M's tractor sales clock healthy gains as well. And four ministers confirmed their res resignation as Prime Minister Modi gears up to reshuffle his cabinet on Sunday. Sources say Nitin Gadkari, Piyush Goel and Dharmendra Pradhan are likely to be promoted. And Rajiv Kumar replaces Arvind Panagriya as the vice chairman of the government's think tank Niti Aayog. Says policy making must be a participative and not an elitist activity. And the Adani group ties up with Swedish defense major Saab to manufacture the Gripen E fighter in India. The partner is set to bid for India's single engine fighter, fighter jet deal. Former Infosys chairman R. Sesha Sai hits back at Narayan Murthy, calls Murthy's charges quoting an anonymous whistleblower as slanderous and patently offensive. Aditya Virla Capital lists at 237 rupees, which is way above market expectations, but trading stops as the stock falls 5% below the pre open price. After the divestment department's nudge, five rail PSUs expected to submit their draft red herring prospectus to SEBI in a month's time. The government keen to list three PSUs this fiscal. That's an exclusive. Well, so those are the headlines at the Saad. This is a show where our team at CNBC TV 18 gets you all the top stories of the day. I'm Arif Shirvani and you're watching Reporter's Diary. But first up, let's get to you all the market action of the day. So, the Lal Street ended the week on a positive note. Uh, the Nifty ended close to the 10,000 mark, while the Sensex closed 160 points higher at the close of trade. Uh, the bank stocks mirrored the benchmark indices, while the mid caps continued their fine run, outperforming yet again. Uh, that index closing 1.25% in the green. Uh, Anuj Singhal is standing by to analyze the market further for us. Uh, Anuj, the bulls seem to be regaining lost ground one day at a time. Big surge for the market. Uh, yesterday was, of course, about expiry, but today the market has confirmed one thing, that the range could well be over and this market could well be headed back towards the 10,000 mark. In fact, it's just about 20 or 30 points away from that, so it could happen on Monday itself. What led the market move today was the auto sales numbers. That's always the most important number to track, and today that number helped the markets, and across the board we saw a big surge, and that led to... Uh, even mid-cap rally. In fact, the mid-cap index is now within 0.7% of a new lifetime high. That's how swift the rally has been from the low point. Autos, as I said, sector of the day, so Tata Motors, Bajaj Auto, Ashok Leyland, all doing well. Pharma was rallying today, led by Dr. Reddy's. Metal stocks look good, looked good today, led by Hindalco. And other nifty gainers today included names like Asian Paints, Indesin, and BPCL. And in the FNO space, big gainers today, Sun TV, IDFC, and Reliance Capital. What next? September normally is a trend month for the market. I've seen uh, in the past 7 to 8% gains or losses uh, for the market. So it will be an interesting month to track for sure. The market is closer to previous highs and has put behind a correction. And if the template is to be believed, then uh, we could be talking about higher highs pretty soon. Right, so a clear bounce back by the market. Thanks, Anush, for joining us with all the details from there. But moving on to the auto sector, where sales have spiked in August, uh, recovering well from the aftermath of the goods and services tax rollout. Uh, so industry biggies like Maruti Suzuki, Ashok Leyland, Aisha Motors, they've all recorded more than 20% uh, 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 growth in sales. But Bajaj Auto uh, has seen weaker growth at around 3%. Uh, Naveen Shetty has been looking at all that data, and he joins us now with a breakdown. Uh, Naveen, uh, Naveen, how are the numbers stacking up? 
Well, the street cheered the auto sales numbers across all segments. In fact, all companies also. Ashok Leyland, that was the biggest surprise. The CV sales jumped by 25%. In fact, the MNH CV, that is where the increase by 29%, which overall aided the numbers also. This is majorly because of the restocking that is happening post GST. On the other hand, Aisha Motors, steady as steady can be. The total sales for the Royal Enfield jumped by 22%. And the bulk of the sales happened in the sub 350cc segment. Uh, if you see Maru, See? Maruti also the street was building in an expectation of close to 22%. 24% is what Maruti delivered in terms of their overall PV sales. Bajaj Auto tepid expectations ahead of the sales numbers, but they surprised positively. The overall sales jumped by 3%, but exports, remember the management was cautiously optimistic on their export sales. That came in as a big positive surprise of up by 7% in terms of the exports. Escorts also, escorts is more or less known. So restocking post the GST, because of which you see the total sales jumping by 23%. Uh, coming on to m and tractor sales over here, that has been quite a bit positive. 22% versus the street expectation of almost 18% growth. Also, if you see the automotive segment, that has been more or less steady, 4% growth. Street was expecting around 5%, but yeah, in still there was some cheer that we had seen on the stock. Coming on to Tata Motors, big surprise, total sales up 14%, led by CV segment. CV segment as in a whole grew by 34%. Why? Because their um, MNH CV segment, which is working on a low base uh, in the base year, that see our jump of close to 52%. Overall, strong set of numbers by automakers, and that is one reason why you saw most of the stock up in trade today back to you right Naveen thanks for joining us with a breakdown of those numbers but staying with news from the auto sector it seems like Tata Motors cries have been heard uh, sources are telling CNBC TV 18 that the decks are cleared for the company to bid for the government's tender for 10,000 electric cars now this after the state-owned company energy efficiency services limited or ESL uh, relaxed its bidding requirements so last week uh, if you remember we told you how Tata Motors had uh, raised objections over the bidding norms which it said were highly skewered in favor of M&M uh, Ron Joy Banerjee brought us that story and he joins us today with all the exclusive details. Uh, Ron, uh, so what has changed now? Uh, how does Tata Motors stand to benefit from this? Well, Tata Motors clearly has its way now because, uh, you know, just to put some context to it, uh, uh, earlier last month, uh, EESL, as you mentioned, had come out with a tender to acquire 10,000 electric vehicles. And at that point, Tata Motors had complained, saying that those tenders were heavily skewed in favor of just ma one manufacturer, that is Mahindra and Mahindra. Uh, because only one model was sort of making the cut, that was Mahindra's e editor which is a sedan. Now, the importantly, what we now learn is that earlier this week on Wednesday, uh, ESL has now taken an in-principle decision to change some of the bidding norms. An official notification will come out in some time from now. And where what we understand now is that earlier the... The minimum length of the car that ESL was looking to acquire under this tender was above 4 meters. Now they've brought it down to under 4 meters. Why does it uh, benefit Tata Motors? Because Tata Motors is looking to come out with a powertrain version of one of their small cars. In all probability, it's going to be the Tiago, which is what they want now to compete uh, uh, you know, for this uh, 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 tender to acquire 10,000 electric vehicles. Not just that. We mentioned this earlier. This is a global tender, but for all practical purposes, it benefits right. only the domestic players because, you know, because of the high customs duty. We also learn ESL has now written to the finance minister to waive off the customs duty for some of the global electric cars like the ones in Nissan so that they can uh, uh, import it duty-free. So those right. are the details. Right. Right, Ron. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, but now uh, we're also joined by Shireen. She's in conversation with the former law minister and Rajya Sabha MP Kapil Sibyl. Let's go across to that conversation. Shireen? One, two, three, four. Is it okay? Well, many thanks for joining us uh, here on the CNBC TV 18 special newsmaker. I'm in conversation with Mr. Kapil Sibyl. And we intend to talk about a lot of the current issues, including demonetization. So I appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 18. You're a lawyer, so you know that both sides can be argued equally successfully. And perhaps that's what we're seeing happen as far as demonetization monetization is concerned. The opposition claims that it's been a disaster. The government says that, look, don't just look at it from the prism of the money that's returned into the banking system. There are other objectives, eight objectives that the finance minister has articulated that demonetization has perhaps been a success and will be a success in future as well. Let me just go to the numbers that the CBDT has put out and then I'll get you to respond to that. Just on the issue of black money, uh, the CBDT says 158% increase in the number of searches, 106% increase in seizures from 712 crores to 1,469 crores, 38 percent increase in the admission of undisclosed income from 11,226 crores to 15,496 crores, a 44 percent increase in undisclosed income from 9,654 crores to 13,920 crores. As I said, you can argue both sides. 
Well, we get we shouldn't get lost in numbers. Hmm. Um, uh, there will be seizures. Uh, there will be discovery of black money. It's happened in the past. It'll happen in the future. Question is, this has to go through a whole process of assessments and appeals and high court and supreme court. So I think when you when those real numbers come on record, hmm. then you can claim either success or failure. But that's really not the issue today. Hmm. The real issue is, what did the Prime Minister say when he announced demonetization? He said that we're going to get rid of black money. He said that this is really a surgical strike on black money. But what really happened was that all that black money mm. that they should have gone after, they allowed a process for people actually to exchange, mm. to launder that black money into mm. the banking system and get it back. Mm. Uh, so, in a sense, the whole demonetization process was a facility to launder money for those who were black marketeers mm. who had black money. Mm. And remember, the rich people got away with it. Mm. But eight, 800 million people in this country mm. who earn 10,000 rupees a month have legitimate cash in their hands. Mm. And that was also frozen. So, you caused, caused untold misery to the ordinary man mm. and you allow the rich man to get away with it. Since you're talking about how this provided a facility to the rich to launder their money, uh, the finance minister's argument, and I'll throw some more data at you, the finance minister's argument is that, look, this is money that's actually now come back into the banking system and this is now money that we are going to be able to go after. What he has said is that 18 lakh accounts are now under scrutiny and that the CBDT has actually identified a further 5.56 lakh accounts uh, that it intends to scrutinize scrutinize, investigate and probe. So his argument is, look, uh, you, now we know who we're going to be able to go after and the process of going after them has begun. Two answers to that. Number one, so he has given up that this was not a strike against black money at all. That means he must now confess that we allowed those people who had black money without going after them to allow them to come to, uh, to access the banking system and legitimize it. So therefore the original objective mm. to get rid of black money has been lost. And mm. remember this, those who legitimate, legitimized it, legitimized it through third persons, not themselves. Mm. If, I had, if, if a rich person had cash in his hand, say one crore, he will get 50 other people to, to have it legitimized. And then that money will go back into the, into, uh, uh, will become black again because he'll withdraw that money mm. and give it back in black to the original person mm. who, who, who legitimized the one crore. So, in fact, it's not answering the question at all. Mm. In fact, you are giving legitimacy to, in fact, black money through this process. Mm. So, uh, you know, what is done is done now. In terms of the way forward, what is it that, uh, you know, for instance, the Congress party intends to do on this issue? Nothing. We will expose them in times to come. There's going to be a parliament session in November. Mm. We will ask very serious questions. Why did you do this? You gave four reasons to the country. And all four have failed. You said fake notes. Fake notes are back. And how much fake, no, fake notes did you have in the system? 400 crores worth. Mm. Of a total amount of 15 lakh, 45,000 crores, you got back into the system 15 lakh, 28,000 crores. Mm. And I dare say the 16,000 crores that has not come back into mm. the system is in uh, perhaps, I don't want to mention it, but perhaps with some neighboring, uh, uh, some of our neighbors and, and some NRIs. Mm. Who, who take black money, who take cash out and want to come back and have something to spend, who couldn't mm. convert, mm. right? So in fact, you probably have more black, more cash in the system than mm. what you envisage. Mm. This is a very serious situation. And then you said that you're going to get rid of terrorism. Terrorism is on the rise. You see the number of incidents that have happened ever since this government came, to, uh, came into power. Mm. So all the objectives that you set out to achieve, you just didn't achieve. And now you are saying, we want a cashless society. Where is the cashless society? Well, less cash now, not cashless. It's, it's a now less it's cash now, now it's less cash. Less cash. Well, where is that less cash? Hmm. Now you say there are 17, you know, 17 percent increase in, in digital payments hmm. and stuff like that. Hmm. But well, what is the tax that you're going to recover? That's hmm. ultimately the analysis. Hmm. The 10,000 people who earn 10,000 rupees a month are continuing to earn probably less than 10,000 right. now. So you will raise this issue in Parliament Very in, seriously. in the next session? Very seriously. Okay. Let me now move on to uh, other current issues and let me ask you about uh, what you expect as far as the road ahead on Aadhaar is concerned. We have now have the Supreme Court uh, give us that landmark judgment on the right to privacy. What will its implications realistically be 
be for the Aadhaar program. The matter is going to be tried in the Supreme Court. Uh, there are two separate issues that will be uh, taken up by the Apex Court. What should we now realistically expect? There are two issues here. One is the issue of privacy itself, and the other is the issue of data protection. Now, I think a legitimate argument can be raised that when you come to the public distribution system to target, um, target people who should receive the benefit, target people who should receive the benefit mm. of the public distribution system, you need their Aadhaar number. And I think on that count, uh, I think we all should accept the fact that that's the only way to ensure that the public distribution system does not actually um, uh, give it leakage. Give it, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's one part of it. But when you extend Aadhaar mm. to other activities, mm. it raises issues of privacy mm. and it also raises the second issue of data protection. So you think linking Aadhaar to DBT, PDS, etc., government schemes to ensure that there is no leakage in the system or less leakage in the system, you're fine with that. No, no, I, and, and that, that does, you know, it suffices that, the public good objective exactly, that the Supreme Court exactly, chose. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I don't think the Congress party or any of us should stand up and say that this is bad for the system. Mm. I think this is good for the system. Mm. But when you come to have to give your Aadhaar number to your airlines, mm. Right or Aadhaar number to your mobile phone operators, mm. right to your service providers, mm. that raises very serious questions because without without a data protection law mm. and breach of the data protection law and the consequences mm. that people will have to suffer, without that being put put in place, uh, it, it's a very it, it's a very dangerous scenario for 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 the issues of privacy. Mm. So I think that that's why the Sri Krishna Committee has been set up. By December, the Sri Krishna Committee will give its report as to what is the kind of data protection law. Then each of the players in the system, mm. uh, whether it's airlines or any other private yeah. enterprise or the yeah. banking system, mm. will have to actually adopt the data protection law, mm. put it in the public space, mm. then it will be scrutinized. It's an important point that you make. So how does it change the landscape as far as non-state actors are concerned? It changes the landscape. Even non-state actors will have to have a data protection law. Mm. Because take, for example, uh, Google, right, or, or any of the platforms that we have. We need a data protection law. How do we know that our data is not being actually um, uh, uh, accessed by other people? Mm. So that needs, and, and not just data protection law, they have to commit themselves to mm. that law, and there should be systems in which we, somebody can go and complain uh, for, for violation of that law, and then should be penalties should be imposed. Mm. Uh, these are very serious matters because government can actually, the other issue is, I, for example, go to a hospital and I reveal uh, a government hospital mm. and the government hospital makes me fill my form and what is wrong with me physically, mm. right? Now that's private. Mm. It's between me and the government hospital. Mm. Can another government agency access, access that? Mm. If I go to the income tax department mm. and furnish my return, mm. they know my income. Can another department of the government of India access that? Because mm. that's confidentiality between mm. me and the income tax department. Mm. These are very serious issues that are going to have to be adjudicated in mm. times to come. So, which means that each of these issues, there will have to be case law, will have to be dealt with on Absol a case by case Absolutely. basis. Supposing somebody comes to search my premises mm. and, the, and, the, uh, and the information that they have is that I have got two gold bars in my house. Mm. But when they come into this house, they start rummaging everything. Mm. They start looking at my wife's correspondence. Mm. The issue is, is this not a violation of privacy? Mm. Now, these issues could not have risen, arisen before mm. because privacy was not uh, a fundamental right. But mm. these are issues now. Therefore, the extent of searches, the, the discretion of the officer concerned in the context of mm. a search, all these issues are at large. I want to talk to you now about another case that you were involved with, and that is the triple the luck matter where we've also seen the Supreme Court uh, give its judgment. Uh, in a conversation that you and I had just a short while ago, you said that uh, the Supreme Court intervening in this matter would be a slippery slope. Now the fact is that the Supreme Court has given its judgment. It has said that triple the luck in one instance uh, is unconstitutional, it's invalid. Uh, now the talk about moving towards a uniform civil code. Uh, given the, the verdict that we have seen from the Supreme Court, what ro windows does it open up uh, outside of this particular Well, you know, uh, there issue? are two aspects of the judgment perhaps most people don't know about it. The first aspect is that this form of triple talaq, which was not even uh, looked upon uh, uh, positively by, by, by anybody in this country, including the Muslim Law Personal mm. Law Board. And mm. we said in court that now in the Nikanama, we'll include a particular provision 
uh, that will set out that the woman is entitled to say that I am not going to accept triple talaq and the man if he wants to marry her will have to be subject to that condition. That's one part of mm. it. And I think this is a declining practice or only about 0.44% of the Muslim community exercise this form of triple talaq. Mm. And the reason why two judges had it to be unconstitutional, yeah. one judge said that it doesn't have sanction from the Quran, mm. not because it's unconstitutional, right? And the other two judges said that though, though it's part of personal law, mm. yet we injunct it mm. for a period of six months till mm. parliament legislates. Mm. So in a sense, all five judges mm. said the same thing, that mm. this particular form of triple talaq is not good. And I think we must accept that. Mm. The problem is that other two forms of triple talaq and other parts of personal law of the, mm. of the Muslim community mm. have now been protected by the majority, mm. by Justice Korean mm. uh, agreeing with uh, the Chief Justice as well as Justice Nazir that that personal laws cannot be interfered with mm. and it is a violation of, 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 the, of the fundamental rights mm. of, of the community. So therefore there is no way forward mm. because if you want to have a uniform civil code mm. then you will have to justify as to how you can interfere with personal law because the majority judgment of the Supreme Court says you cannot. Mm. Right? And if, you, if, if there is of course a movement throughout the country that personal laws of all communities mm must be looked at afresh. I don't think that uh, this government or any government will dare do that because the kind of... See, the problem with mm. these issues is patriarchy, mm. right? It's the issue of patriarchy that is prevalent in every community. Yes, unfortunately. Right? Mm. That has to be attacked by all of us together. Mm. Unless you deal with that, unless women become... Uh, you can stand on their own feet, become mm. educated or emancipated. It's you have to break down the social structure mm. that encourages patriarchy. Mm. And unless we do that, we're not going to get any reform. Mm. So uh, speaking of reforms, uh, you said that demonetization is going to be an issue that the Congress intends to raise in the next session of Parliament. You know, what, what is the political strategy now of the Congress party, Mr. Sibyl? I mean, what should we realistically expect of the Congress as an opposition? I think... I think uh, my suspicion, and I think hopefully uh, it should come out at some stage or the other because somebody honest in the system will reveal it, that when this conversion took place, mm. it could not have been done without the consent of the banking system mm. and without the consent of the political system. Mm. And I, when I mean the political system is the BJP, mm. because they are the ones who are in power which means that they were in fact party participating mm. in perhaps the biggest scam that has happened in the history of India mm. by conversion of black money into white in which they were participants. I pray to God that somebody, some honest officer tells the truth to the people of this country mm. and if it does all hell will break loose. Outside of demonetization, what else uh, uh, is going to be part of the strategy as far as the Congress is concerned? I think concerned? We, must, we must work on the ground. In fact, uh, I am very, very disturbed by the fact that uh, in the recent elections, very recent elections, in Delhi, for example, yes, in Bhavana, Bhavana yeah. we were number three. Mm. And we are ecstatic about the fact that our vote share has gone up. Mm. I don't think that a national party mm. uh, should sort of pat itself on the back mm. and say that, you know, our voting share has gone up. You're disappointed. People like Jairam Ramesh uh, talk about the existential dilemma and existential crisis that the Congress finds I mean, itself I'm, I'm in. But, but then why is it that senior leaders of the Congress party like yourselves, like Jairam Ramesh, are, are, are not able to change the narrative, are not able no, to actually no, think, articulate what the strategy is going to be going forward? This has to be, to be a forward. collective exercise and all of us, I think that all, all congressmen, uh, young and old, uh, Where are experienced, young? Where are experienced, young? experienced and not so experienced, uh, and, and some of the young are very, very, very good in our mm. party. I think all of us would get together and say to our, ask ourselves mm. the question: Is this the Congress mm. of, uh, of, when, of 19 of 19 and of 1950? When, when is this introspection? When is this moment uh, of, think, of of sort of consultative, participative democracy going to result it, in it, a decision? It, 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 as will, far as the Congress it will come is about. Concerned. It has to happen. Nobody can stop it because Congress Party is not just a political party. Mm. It is a movement. Mm. It, you know, it, it doesn't look like either a movement or a political it party may be, it today. May not, it may not. It may not. It mm. may not. But I think that we need to um, uh, energize the party by going back to the principles mm. on the basis of which Congress stood uh, and, and, and that sense of self-sacrifice. Any time uh, before 2019, you think? I think immediately. Immediately? Immediately. 
is there something that that is being worked on at this it's point? It's not a question. I think that all right-thinking congressmen uh, will are thinking about this and saying to themselves, it's time for for the Congress to fight and fight on the basis of ideology and what's uh, and and what and we will not let this legacy leadership. Die. No matter what happens, we'll not let this legacy. So leadership comes from the party, mm. right? And those issues will also be resolved. I have no problems with that. But I think we must sustain the legacy of the Congress party. Is it time for a change of leadership? Well, I'm not going to say. Don't get me involved in I individual won't. questions. Okay. That's not the point. But it's time for us to regain the legacy of the party and you believe to revitalize it to re-energize it and you think that this is likely to happen uh, it has to happen but you feel confident about it because as I'm I said, confident. We, you know people like you people like mr ramesh people like mr chidambaram have been talking about this yes, but yet I'm, we haven't I'm seen, confident we I'm, haven't seen any changes i'm the confident ground. it'll it'll happen you're confident i have it'll no doubts about it no doubts about it kapil sibal always a pleasure speaking with you many thanks for joining us here on the cnbc tv 18 newsmaker for today well that is the former law minister and the former uh, it minister as well kapil sibal we'll take a quick break when we return there's a lot more here on cnbc tv 18 stay right there Thank you.